right, uh, my name is Ron Minnick, and I work on our open source projects at Google, and I'm here today to talk about a program I built for Plan 9 originally called the Center. And the Center, as a name, actually has a history with Plan 9. If somebody wants to talk about it after the talk, I can tell the story. So the simple story here is, uh, since COVID, I've had a closet full of Linux and Plan 9 systems and other things. So I've got a workbench with these atomic pies and, and ARM boards stacked up on it and a network switch. And then I have a closet and things rotate through that closet pretty quickly as I do development on new and different motherboards. So I have services I need to boot, run, and manage them. And those are all provided by the center right now. So that's DHCP, TFTP, HTTP, and 9P on IP6 and 4. It's 436 lines of Go. It builds in a tenth of a second. There is no auto config, no CPP magic, no make file hackery, and in fact, there's no make file. Cross build comes for free because that's the way Go works. So if I want to run this on my digital loggers power controller, I say go arc equal MIPS, go MIPS equals soft load, go build dot, and I can then run it on my power controller. The only configuration file I have is Etsy host. I'll get into more later about that. It probably seems pretty weird, but it actually works incredibly well. And there's no persistent state. There are no leases. There's no random files littered all over your file system in places like Etsy and bar. There's just Etsy hosts. So Center made my life a lot better. It reduced my complexity. I no longer had to figure out which of four possible demons to run from the hundreds of choices available. I got rid of all the weird configuration file formats that seemed to change with every release of every distro I had. Sometimes I want to run the center on OS X or Plan 9 or Linux, and I can do that. I'm, I have to be honest here. I haven't tested it on Windows. It should work, but I really don't know if it does. I've got one file that I can move around for configuration in one simple format. And I really want to run potentially those services on stateless servers. So I have these little IoT nodes like the Atomic Pi. And I run them with a CPU daemon, which Daniel will talk about next. And I might just run the center on them. And what's kind of nice is anytime I think my service is in a bad state, I just power cycle the node, who cares? Uh, setting up, starting, and stopping these services is really very easy because it's just one program. I don't even bother to create unit files or sysv init scripts because I, I just don't really need them. If you've done any of this sysadmin stuff for a network of little nodes, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Why am I not just using things like DNS mask? And by the way, I do like DNS mask or all the other actually pretty good existing servers for this task. A lot of them are actually very Linux centric and I don't want to limit myself to running things only on Linux. I want things that run on say OS X. All these systems, Plan 9, everything, everything is utterly different. I go from one distro of Linux to another, files are in different places. I go from Ubuntu 18 to Ubuntu 20, everything's moved again. It's very frustrating to try and move services across different nodes when things are always in the wrong place. In fact, just last week on a ThinkPad 510 I have that I use interactively, I got into a bad place with NetPlan and the only solution was to completely remove the network manager snap and reinstall it so that it would blow away all the weird files it put in VAR that were derived from NetPlan that were not really linked up very well. So that's a problem. The other thing you frequently read or hear is that all these systems are super intuitive and this applies to me too, right? I'm not, I'm not alone in this. I think intuitive nowadays means the author of the code really understands it well, but it doesn't always mean maybe that it's intuitive. The other thing I realized at some point in the last two years, the ACP is very powerful. It's 30 years old, it's been around. It was kind of designed for people in a building, you know, network enterprise or whatever. Uh, but it actually does a lot more than I need for my, my sort of lab. Yeah, will I have 256 nodes? Yeah, probably. Uh, will I have 16,000? That seems a little less likely unless I buy a nuclear power plant. Will I have 24 million nodes? I will never have 24 million nodes, right? That will never happen. And what that means is in a basic 10 dot class A address, uh, there are enough addresses to last me for as long as I live, which for me is of course forever because that's the rest of the world for my case, right? Uh, for all of us. But if I pick a new IP address every minute starting at January 1, 2020, I will not fill a 10 dot space. And that means I don't need to be too careful about how I pick IP addresses. And that means I don't need leases and lease databases because the whole point of a lease and a lease database is 
You're going to give out an IP address and eventually you're going to take it back and use it somewhere else. I don't care. I'm not going to use them else anywhere else. I can keep my home research cluster behind a gateway and whatever anyone else does won't really affect me. So every time I get a new node, I can actually give it a new IP and that's how I do it. Uh, I haven't actually used up my class C yet, but I'm looking forward to that day. So, so I don't need everything that comes with these DHCP daemons. So how did I get to the center from where I was? I had actually re-implemented 9P one more time in 2015 for the Harvey fork of Plan 9, Harvey OS. And I really got a chance to make it pretty good. That's actually worked kind of bug-free for about seven years. And I realized that the Go community, including Uroot and Linux Boot, which is the logo you can see is the little U there, is another project uh, I started and it is widely used now had really hardened a lot of services that they needed. So Meta contributed a really high quality DHCP service. There's a TFTP server and HTTP server packages out there that are very, very good. They are in use in data centers at the scale of millions of machines at many companies around the world. So by 2020, we had really good service packages written in Go that were industrial strength, right, that I knew that stood up and held up data centers and made them work. So in one commit, 230 new nine lines, I added to three other servers, and that's where Center came from. In the, in the couple last few years since I created it, there have been less than 30 commits. You can kind of interpret that as either no one is using it, which probably is true, but also we haven't needed to do a lot to it to make it continue to work. And Center supports network booting for me. It supports DHCP. And the network booting is done over TFTP and HTTP, but further it supports my Plan 9 nodes with a 9P server. It is finding wider and wider use, which means probably now eight people use it instead of me. Uh, you know, so it's a little more than just me. Uh, but it does run on things like this digital loggers power controller, which is kind of fun. So I thought for this talk, rather than talk a lot about what it does, I'd kind of talk about what code I looked at what's out there and then what I was able to write then give you an overview of what does it take to make these services work. So 9P servers, uh, there are only really two decent ones in C. I wrote one of them a long time ago and to my surprise it no longer builds. Uh, that's kind of a common experience with C code actually. But there's a very good one from Lawrence Livermore National Labs called Diode and Diode does build Diode's impressively easy to use. You just say sudo dot slash diode dash e and you give it a directory and it serves 9p2000.l on that directory. And this is great. This is, this is actually used by people for real things. The only problem from my point of view, it's still a single function program. It just does 9p. It's written in C and I've been done with C for you know, quite a few years now. That doesn't mean I do C++. I actually don't do C++. I just try and use other languages when I'm out of the kernel. And that code has actually surprisingly been a little bit hard for people to read over the years. But it does meet the bar of it builds, which is good, and it's simple to start up, which is also good. But it, it's not going to work on OS X or Plan 9. So 9P was the first service in center. Uh, again, not all my machines run Linux. I want it to run on things other than Linux. But the thing is, writing a 9P server nowadays is really, really easy. And so you might say, well, how easy? So that's a 9P server. And basically, this is the pattern of a lot of the servers in Golang. You do a listen, you construct sort of a listener for the service in question, and then you hand that off to a server loop, right? This is your basic server loop. So you can see the top lines here are a listen on the TCP4 network, and that star there, it's just the way Go switches work. You get a pointer to a, to a string in this case, so I dereference it for the call to net.listen. Then I call UFS, which is part of my 9P package for Harvey. I create a new UFS with some options. If that doesn't work, I blow out of this thing, and then I fire up a listener. So the 9P server library I wrote, which was based on the Murchowski and Ayankov earlier Go 9P, is 3,980 lines. 2,000 of those lines are, are generated code. There's an RPC generator in there using purely Go. It's all Go and there are 500 lines of test. So basically the 9P server is 1,500 lines of code. DHCP tools, there are a fair number of choices for DHCP tools. This was my first stop on an extending center. I've been using DNS mast for a long time. It's very good. Uh, I've also used the KEA servers. It's kind of odd that 
when you use them, you've kind of got to be aware that you're going to use the 6 or the 4 version. One thing about that is that um, 6 and 4 DHCP are really, really utterly different. So it kind of makes sense that they have a different name, but at the same time, if you're just a sysadmin trying to run a network, you, maybe you wouldn't want to think about having to install one or the other. The other standard is IAC DHCP. It's a 38-page manual, 110,000 lines of code. There's files that get littered all over your system you have to keep track of because you know, you're in big trouble if you, if you change things, but there's leases hanging around and your changes don't propagate through because there's a lease active. The thing is, it also doesn't build. So I've tried this a couple times, bringing down ISC DHCP, and it takes 80 seconds, and then it says I can't build. It gets some error. I forget what it is. And that's just a really common thing nowadays with C code across different distros. It's very, very common in my experience to pull these things down and see things fail to build. And as the configure files and the code gets more and more complex, almost in an effort to be more portable, I found it to actually be less portable. Weird, weird effect. The thing is, writing a DHCP server is actually pretty easy nowadays. And again, here's our sort of create a structure, create a listener, fire off the service. Um, here I'm setting up a structure called a DHCP server 4. So in the code, you're aware of the difference. But hopefully outside, you don't see it as much. And we set up things like the boot file name, the root path, that, that sort of thing. Then we create a new server, which is from the server for package from, from Meta. And then finally, we fire off the server loop. Again, just this simple pattern of a couple of lines of code to, to create sort of the parameters of the server and then fire off a server loop. Now, that's not the full story with DHCP because you've got to figure out what you're going to do when you get a request packet, and they're a little bit more complicated than, than it first seems. You can get a message of a type discover or a message of a type request. And so you kind of have to look at the, me the message you get, which is this second, the third parameter here, the dhcpv4.dhcp4 packet. Um, and then you've got to say, all right, well, if I get a discover, I'm going to do an offer. And if I get a request, I'm going to do an ACK. And then there's a bunch of other little modifiers I need to add to the response packet, the reply type, the server IP, the router, the submask, your IP, which is the YIP field in DHCP. And just, just, there's just these little things you've got to fill in to make a complete response from a DHCP server. So you do that, then you send it. And you, you've been given a connection to write to, so you write to that connection. If you get an error on that, you log the error, but you don't quit because Errors happen all the time in, in these uh, networks. So the DHCP server for 4 and 6 is 10,000 lines of code. That shouldn't shock you because it actually is a really complicated thing to do. Um, and, and I should also mention that simple call that I just showed you, which maybe didn't look that simple, but Meta, went back when they were Facebook, provided this industrial strength DHCP that they had tested out in their data centers in 2017. There have been 656 commits over that time from a lot of different companies that have, that have hardened that thing a lot. And it is used by several hyperscalers and manufacturing operations and cloud providers in their data centers today. So Andrea Barbario contributed that, so kind of thanks to him and, and Facebook or Meta. I keep saying the wrong name uh, for making that available. TFTP, there's less choice. I like less choice. There's only nine server choices. My favorite for a long time has been HPA's TFTPD. So I thought, all right, let's see if it builds, because it's good code, and it, I usually have had luck building it. So I did the git clone, cd make, and fail. Uh, and in spite of the fact that there's a 9,500 line configure script, we get this error that I really didn't even want to follow through, but you know, it just didn't work. And this is more and more, as I say, common experience I've had with these kinds of tools. The other funny thing, TFTP is dead simple. The T means trivial. It really actually wasn't intended to hang around very long. It was viewed as kind of a stopgap. It's been around 30 years now. Uh, why are there 2.2 million hits on TFTP? And what I realized as I read through these, it's because of all the interactions. So TFTP kind of engages DHCP. It engages a lot of other things that you have to do. You've got to figure out how to set up the unit files and the setup scripts and all these things. And I, I didn't want any of that, right? TFTP is dramatically, is, is very, very tightly coupled to DHCP. The easiest way to make them completely connected is to just put it in one program, and that's what the center does. So writing a TFTP server turns out to be very easy. This is how easy it is. There's a TFTP package in Golang. Um, basically, we're saying here we're going to create a new server, tftp.newserver. It's going to serve on that address, which is a string. Uh, the syntax is 
IP address colon port, then if the IP address is empty, it means get it from anywhere. And then we also say down here, the server.read handler, we're saying the read handler is going to be a file server and a TFTP dir is the, the switch I gave it to say where it serves from. Then we do the listen and serve, done. So that's the TFTP server. As you can guess, most of the code I had to put in for this was the DHCP part. Uh, HTTP, uh, so my home boots, uh, when, I do, when I do network boot, I do HTTP. Increasingly, so do all the hyperscalers. TFTP is, is actually a pretty terrible protocol to use for network boot. It's easy to do man in the middle. And I've been told that 400 TFTP clients will bring a, even a pretty heavy duty server to its knees. And if you, you really run a lot of HTTP streams, you know how many tens of thousands you can run from even, from even not a very powerful server. So people are moving to HTTPS for network boot. In any event, I want the same set of files in the same place for 9P, TFTPD, and HTTP, HTTPD, and that, that's what I implement. So great, well, let's take a look around. There are 400 options. Everybody wants to write these. They're actually, you know, tech, supposed to be not too hard to write. I pulled down mini HTTPD because it looks small and it doesn't build. Well, it's been around, last mod was 2013, shouldn't surprise me. I look around a little more, I find this thing called WebFS, I didn't realize it, but it was Go. Uh, so to get it, you do a Go install with that path, and to build for Darwin, Go OS equal Darwin, to build for Plan 9, Go OS equal Plan 9, Go build. And again, over and over and over again, I've learned in the last dozen years, if I want portable code that'll build, I'm gonna write it in Go. I will not write that kind of thing in C because the portability problem is a little too hard. Uh, but that server source is a bit large. You know, it's a couple hundred lines. It has some JavaScript to make things look good. And the thing is, writing an HTTP server is actually very easy. That's an HTTP server for files. So basically, uh, the, the, the package kind of has the ability to say, well, I'll give you an instance of an HTTP server, but if you only need one, just call me a couple times with the right thing. So in the innermost part there, I say, well, set the directory for serving files to star HTTP, dear. Reminder, that's kind of how the, the switches work. So I set up an HTTP directory, then I set up the option so that the handle for the root of the HTTP URL space is a file server. And then I fire off the list and serve and I'm done. So that's my HTTP server in two lines. Now, HTTP is part of the Go standard library. It is extraordinarily well hardened because we use it at Google internally and so you know, it has to work at that scale and at that level of reliability. It's 50,000 lines of, of pure Go code. But 25,000 of those lines are tests, which makes me happy. I like tests. And, you know, again, we've never seen a problem with this HTTP server in, in the last years we've been using it. So what about config files? That was another thing I decided to revisit. I got really tired of chasing down lease files and config files and changing syntax and all this stuff. And I thought about it and thought, you know what? Um, all I want to know is if, I, if, if someone comes at me with a Mac, what's the IP? And everything else is served from one directory, and I don't want to do leases. And so I came up with this idea that, hey, I can make a weird host file entry, which is you and the octets for the Mac. And so that's the way it works. Uh, and basically what Center does, when it gets a packet, it looks it up in SE hosts, and if it finds that weird host name, it says, okay, well, here's your IP. And this works the same for either IP6 or IP4 entries. I know that's a, this seems a little crazy. It's actually crazily convenient. I've been surprised about how easy it is. And the other funny thing is if I have a Mac, I can just you know, ping the host name with the Mac. And that is something I never expected to use, and it, turned out to be, it turns out to be pretty handy. So here's the code to look up Mac addresses and hosts. So remember the DHCP message. Uh, you can pull out the client hardware address. That's what that client HW adder thing is there. Can it turn it to a string? The replace is to throw the colons away because colons aren't legal in a file in, in a host name. Look it up. If it's not specified, let's look at the bottom of this slide. You see it says not responding to DHCP requests for Mac, and it sh shows you the Mac, and then it tells you how to create a host entry that will respond to that. Should I stop now, or I've got. Okay, good. Uh, I want to really leave room for questions. I'm sorry if I'm running a little over. Now, here's the thing. Center is stateless. And, and it's stateless even, it actually opens and reads hosts for every lookup. And I expect to get a lot of pushback on that, but um, I've been in this game since the very early days of 
you know, sending a sync up to PID1 and getting it to reread, you know, things. And that was done on machines with core memory, with five megabyte disks, without a block cache, without a page cache. Fact of the matter is, a lot of this activity of sig cup and then reread the config file isn't really needed in a lot of cases. It needs to be revisited. I can reread host 30,000 times a second with this program. I don't get anywhere near one one thousandth of that level of DHCP requests in, in my lab. So, you know what? Open, read, close that t-host every time I get a request is an extremely pragmatic way to address the problem. Now I don't need to worry about sending a PID1 or PID of center a HUP anymore, right? If I need to add something to a file, I add it. It'll pick it up the next time it gets a request. Here's how you invoke it. I'm going to make these slides available, so I'm not going to worry about this right now because I kind of ran over my, my time here. Uh, but anyway, if you need the ACP and you don't really want to run four daemons, you'd like to run one, and you'd like to control it a little better, and you're tired of all these weird sort of config files and lease files and things, this might work for you. It's 459 lines ago. It's at github.com. You're welcome to take a look. You're welcome to send me bug reports. You're welcome to tell me better ways to do things. I really appreciate it when people look at code and, um, you know, get back to me and tell me how to do things better. So I'd be delighted if any of you want to take a look and, and see what you think. And that is it. Um, and I guess I have three minutes for questions before the next great talk. Yeah.